There we go. Welcome everybody who's just signing on tonight to our Carla Dundas celebration and launch. It's going to be a really fantastic evening. I think you're all going to enjoy it. I hope you're sitting warm, toasty, glass of wine, some friends, <laughs> because you are going to uh, get a great tour of the neighborhood from your living room tonight. We'll just wait for all the participants to log on. And then we, we shall start. I just want to welcome everybody tonight. Thank you for joining us on this webinar to really celebrate a great new piece of art and public space in the community. But first, I would like to acknowledge that the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Tonight, we are going to spend some time looking at the neighbourhood, and we are going to meet a whole bunch of really interesting people that worked on the triangle, that worked on Jimmy Simpson, and that are going to work on Badger Parquet. But first, I'm just going to ask everybody a question. I'm going to do a poll just to find out who is with us tonight. And this is the first question is, where do you live? In the Carla Dundas neighborhood, elsewhere in Leslieville, or outside of Leslieville? Let's see who's with us tonight. Here we go. I'm going to end that polling very shortly. And we can see that there are 61% live right in the neighborhood, 10% elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in Leslieville, and 29% outside of Leslieville. So welcome to everyone tonight. Just give you a tiny little bit of background on the area. It is a former industrial area. When I first moved to the East End, it was still, Colgate's was still going strong and my neighbor worked at the Colgate factory with free trade, the jobs left, and it has now a area for culture, for live work. It was great. People uh, lived and, and had many uh, galleries in the lofts. And so the city created a policy to have a live work zone it has a special policy here for the city of Toronto. And you'll hear more about that later. All along, there have been studies about this neighborhood. And you can see in 1998, there was a Carla study plan that actually introduced the live work concept in the factories that had been closed through free trade. In June 2000, through planning, there was a neighborhood improvement plan. In 2003, there was a Dundas Carlock Quarter Capital Improvement Plan. There have been a lot of different things until 2012, uh, where I made a motion there at Toronto and East York Community Council, and then 2013, where we really dug in with the neighborhood to look at how we were going to bring an initiative called the Carlaw Dundas Community Initiative forward, which would bring all of the public realm features up to meet the very rapid development of all of the old factories uh, on Carlaw. The very first one started, of course, was Colgate's, and it was Natalie Place, and the latest one was 88 Colgate, which was finishing off that project that started so many years ago. And this initiative is what we're living, uh, what we're experiencing now tonight. The boundaries of the study area were Queen Street, Pape, up to Girard, and then all along the tracks. And that is how we find the three projects that we're going to talk about tonight. The, um, 
this is really for all, all you planning uh, people out there. We have a site specific area policy here. It is policy 154. There's not very many of them here in the city, which means that every development has to have a feature for employment because it was a former employment district. This is Toronto's official plan. We can see there, this is all employment. It's not an employment area like Eastern Avenue, which is a core employment area, but it still is an area that has to achieve employment, which is why the focus on live work, commercial condos, and other features that uh, we have in this neighborhood. The, um, this is uh, again, 154 that I mentioned earlier. This is where it is, which is where the city has deemed that through planning, we want to make sure that all the jobs aren't taken right out of the neighborhood. It still is a very job rich neighborhood, including uh, Carla north of Dundas. This area has really transformed over a number of years. There used to be factories, ma uh, manufacturing market gardens, brickyards, and right beside the semi-detached neighborhood that we know so well. And then there was adaptive reuse. And now we have a lot of the, what we're calling a new wave. There's heritage buildings, the live work space. There's eclectic mix of uses. There's cafes, yoga, performance space, and with high density development, because it's an employment zone, it does allow for greater density than other areas in the city. These are all of the different buildings and you can find all of this online for those of you that are really interested. This is when all the approvals were made for developments in the Carla Dundas corridor and the years that they were passed for rezoning and how high they are, all the features that were built in. And you can probably see where you live if you're living in the area. We did have a number of open houses. We had, in order to really launch the initiative and look at what, would, what we would add in to glue the neighborhood together with some beautiful pieces. This, um, there was a few open houses that were held. We had public engagement. We let everybody know there was a stakeholder working group. This was branded. Uh, branded website. And then we had a design competition for the signature marker, neighborhood pop-ups and many other things. It was very exciting to get us to this day. We're going to be looking at those big projects. There was also the little park, John Chang Park. That was part of the original Colgate development. And there is the Boston, I call it the Boston Commons. It's a little stretch on Boston where people walk their dogs. And this was also part of the upgrade for this particular project. And then we have coming up the vision statement that was developed for this project, Dundas Carlaw, community where people live, work and play and learn, adapting and changing while respecting the area's unique character and industrial heritage. And lastly, here's the project sites we're talking about. We have the triangle, and the signature marker. There's Badger O Parquette at Badger O and Carla. There's the Jimmy Simpson Park Gateway. And over here, we have the Boston Boulevard or Boston Commons, which is a magical little space. You almost expect to see a few fairies dancing under the trees when you go there. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. So next, we're going to go to the Heritage Study and let you know about that. And it, Richard Unterman, who has had 35 years of experience in the cultural heritage field. He's a partner at Unterman McPhail Associates, which is a leading heritage consulting firm that works in both public and private clients and heritage resource assessment, conservation, management, and planning for built heritage resources. He's a founder, current member, and former president of the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. And he is presently a member of the City of Toronto uh, Tobacco York Preservation Panel. Richard, we're very happy to have you here with us tonight. And I'm going to go to the first slide because it's got everything in it as far as historical resources in this neighborhood. Go, please, you are on. And I'm unmuting you. 
can't mute him. He's muted. Richard, could you just unmute? Nick. Uh, Richard, could you unmute yourself, please? We can't hear you. Reason it went off. Sorry oh, about that. There you go. <laughs> there no. I am in the corner. There you corner. are. I was trying to get on my headset. That's Sorry. okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, counselor. I've got that <laughs> slide up that you like so much, which has everything yeah. in it. So I'm sure you're going to take us on a guided tour. Of this. Well, I wanted to first thank the study team that we worked with at Sholin um, and company um, and Marcus Hillier, who I worked with uh, quite closely in putting this together, uh, who works at Sholin. And also wanted to thank Marta O'Brien, who did a lot of the primary research on the industrial uh, history of the area in terms of tracking down the companies. And also uh, Joanne Doucette was a, had an invaluable resource that she put together about the area. And also uh, we had a discussion about the area and its history, which helped out. I have to say as a consultant, it, this is a, a quite a, for a prescribed area, it's got a layered history. The industrial aspect of it is quite phenomenal, but it started off as um, you indicated, uh, Councillor, um, you know, over 10,000 years ago with First Nation occupation. But, um, you know, into the 1800s, it then became known for brick making, market gardens, and a bit later nurseries. So it's always had an evolved history. And um, it continued on into the, into the 1900s when the industrial period really started out. And uh, it, it was really fascinating to see um, both the companies that came to the um, area and also how the, the layered history uh, was completed. We did a thematic review, which was great, and it helped to establish what we thought were the themes um, in the study area. So there, the paper that is online that you can review the, uh, the report, um, we did a summary history of the social history, um, the historical history, we looked at transit history, which is very important. But one of the guiding things that's really lovely about the area is it was well mapped. Um, and so we could go back and forth to those maps to confirm what we were reading in textual records and documentation. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, the list of manufacturers here was really quite something because, you know, you had a whole realm of um, uh, people who were supplying uh, manufacturing goods, both heavy and light clothing, food, um, all different types. And as we know, the primary ones that get the highest recognition are Wrigley's and Colgate, Palmolive. But there are a lot of other smaller um, Canadian firms that also started out from doing things with paper um, and um, other um, industrial aspects. One of the other things that's uh, interesting about the, the area is the wartime history that uh, was involved uh, both the First and Second World War. And so, you know, for a small area, um, this really had uh, so much history in it. So it, we were able to prepare a document which in the end was we'd hope would help to inform both the design that was going on as well for some of the aspects of the uh, landscape work, but also to leave a bit of a legacy for the area going forward, which was really quite an important. And, and as we both know, and I think, uh, Councillor, you'll be speaking to um, the Heritage Toronto walking tour, and this became the primary document that they used to develop uh, that walking uh, tour that they have, which uh, people should, uh, you know, provide, um, it provides an opportunity to really explore and understand the area. The other thing is there were some very interesting citizens and many of the streets in the area are named after individuals who were had a primary role in the development or settlement or industry of the area. And in that document, you'll see some of those names um, listed. Uh, I think that, you know, on the whole, uh, for somebody who grew up at Bathurst and St. Clair, it, it, this area was unknown to me in the city of Toronto and, and uh, coming to it was a great surprise. And um, uh, it's interesting that 
the the appreciation of the history that you got in terms of talking to people about the area also helped to inform how valuable uh, the industry was uh, um, to the community and also the surrounding neighborhoods which were developed for residential use for workers housing. So uh, I think, you know, in the end, um, you know, for a study to combine both landscape and heritage, this was a great opportunity and probably sh um, should be afforded uh, this to other areas. I, I know I, I sit on the Etobicoke York panel and that area um, in Mimico and New Toronto certainly has something that's similar to this, but it's never been developed in the same way in terms of uh, it being interpreted, unfortunately. Uh, and I think that's really a summation of, of that. Uh, as I said, the, uh, I was really quite impressed with the level of resources from a cultural heritage point of view. And, uh, and, and I have to say the mapping and the, the, if you can roll through some of the historic images of it, Councillor, we can start to see how this whole area has evolved. And uh, you, know, you can see the real industrial aspect of it. The one other thing that was quite important here is the connection to the rail lines that went through and it forms one of the boundaries of the study area. It allowed for goods produced here to be shipped throughout Ontario and other places um, and also for goods to come in. One of the other interesting facts is that the precursor to the TTC with the expansion of the transit line along Queen Street began here and allowed the area to develop um, uh, into this industrial area because there was access for people uh, coming and working in the area. The next, so these are kind of uh, some of the images that came out of um, uh, the archives, which holds many other uh, images of this quality. They're really quite phenomenal in terms of quality, but you can see uh, this is the Wrigley entrance on Boston Avenue um, and the rail tracks and spur lines that were there. I think there's another one as well beyond that. And here you can see Queen Street looking north and um, into the industrial area. It looks probably in the 40s, I guess, maybe. I, am I right? 48, it says here. So, And there's, I think there's at least one more, potentially. And this is some of the, the industrial areas with um, factory workers, women at this time. And women were quite important during the war and, and were working in industry, as we all know, um, during that period because of the uh, uh, lack of uh, male employees. Unfortunately, many of these and women were not allowed to go back into the um, factories after the war, which was rather disappointing. I think there's at least one more. That was January 1919. Here's the, uh, the bridge over Queen Street built in 1928. At least that's what the abutment says. So uh, I think that's it. I think it gives you an idea. It's, it's just a spectacularly rich uh, cultural history that uh, is uh, contained within this study area. Oops. I can't hear anybody. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I do have a couple of questions. People have asked, can we please send a link to the report? out when this is over and yes we will send everybody a link and they can read and see the entire report and we'll also send a link to the heritage walking tour so all of your work it's spectacular and having this all in one place it's it's just amazing thank you so much for you're that. welcome thank you it's been absolutely wonderful to have this component in this project I am going to ask another question now. I'm going to have another poll. And this really is, uh, this is this. It is, oh, we are going to poll you. And yep, hang on here. Here we go. It's the next one on industrial heritage. How much did you know about the neighborhood's rich industrial heritage before tonight? Uh, I already knew a lot. I knew some of it. I learned a lot tonight. We'll see where it's at. We're not finished, but let's see what, 
what you know. All, all of you great people on here. And I'll say a big cheers to everybody sitting at the Dundas Car Law with the laptop watching and everybody on their balconies watching because you're telling me on the Q&A that that's what you're doing. I am going to end this very shortly and let you see the results. So we have 37% knew a lot, 40 knew some, and 23% of you learned a lot tonight. So that's really good news. I will have another question coming up shortly. But, but first, I'm going to ask, uh, look at the design overview. And this is going to be presented by Paul Nodwell, and he's an award-winning landscape architect and urban designer. He's a principal with Sholin and Company, and Paul draws on over 35 years of experience with and commitment to the public realm. So we're so lucky to have uh, Paul and his firm on this project. And he really has helped to shape the public realm in the whole Greater Toronto area through the design of new communities, parks, and urban squares, and streets, and natural areas. In 2007, Paul joined forces with Sholin and Company, which was an award-winning firm best known for their leadership in sustainable design and low impact development. The Sholin and Company team are committed to the notion that landscapes offer the rare opportunity for poetry and storytelling through design. And I think that when you see the Badger Park cat and you learn more about the obelisk, you are really going to understand that this is storytelling through design and full of poetry. They are equally committed to the creation of memorable places and particularly places that express a tangible narrative. So Paul, I am going to hand this over to you and hopefully you are not muted. I am not muted. Yay, good, okay. Thank, you, Thank you very much for being here tonight and joining us and for all the work. And I'm just going to give you your first slide here for the, the, the three zones that we're looking at. My, my pleasure. Thank you, Councillor. And I, I want to take a minute right at the outset to uh, thank a number of people on the project team who we've been moving forward on this for almost three years. And it's taken a lot of uh, uh, stick-to-itiveness and energy and creativity. Um, certainly yourself, Councillor, for your dogged determination to get this thing uh, off the ground. Also to Richard Unterman, who you just met. And I have to say that the vast majority of design decisions that we made were based on the research that Richard did in uncovering the names of the companies that had worked here and looking at the architecture and the built form that uh, once uh, populated the, the neighborhood. I also want to thank Susan Hall at Lura Group, who um, helped with the communication piece and working with the stakeholder groups. Um, also, Catherine Williams, who was our public art consultant um, and was involved in putting together the committee uh, of residents and stakeholders that helped to select uh, Pierre Poussin's uh, signature marker uh, through a competition. I also want to thank Marcus Hiller in our office, um, who uh, project managed this project and is still involved in project managing. He took on the lion's share of the detail work and in transforming this vision into three dimensions um, and has worked tirelessly to, to uh, see that this comes off. Um, also, I want to thank Peter Didiano and James Duff from the City of Toronto. And uh, also, and I should say that the city served to keep us on track as well <laughs> through this process. Um, also, Dominic Ambrosetti from Furdum Construction, who showed a lot of care in uh, executing the details in construction uh, in a way that uh, would uh, ultimately be sustainable over the long term and would, uh, would met the design objectives that we set out at the beginning. And then lastly, um, Mike Billick from La Fontaine Ironworks, who seems to be doing all of the public art in the city these days, but he's the fabricator of the uh, signature marker and uh, all of the other metal work that you see now at the Jimmy Simpson Park and that you will see 
at uh, Badgero. So uh, much thanks to Mike as well. So the, the plan that you see here is really just a simple identification of the three locations that are part of this contract. The gateway, Jimmy Simpson Park Gateway has been constructed and completed. Uh, I understand that the construction fencing came down on the uh, dundas Carla uh, Triangle today. So that's now up and running. And uh, the third one location just to the north of the triangle is at oh. Patro which uh, we'll, we'll talk about later. So next slide, please. Next slide, here we are. So these are some of the overall objectives. When we, when we looked at developing the design for these three spaces, we also looked at it in terms of a holistic approach to the neighborhood. So we wanted to maintain the industrial character of the area. In fact, I would say and reinforce the industrial character of the area. We wanted to reuse, and this should mean that the, the um, existing buildings and their heritage features, which could translate into landscape elements. Um, the, we wanted to strengthen the Carlisle Dundas as a hub for small business, making these places, places that people are going to want to be in and businesses are going to want to surround. Um, certainly improving streetscapes and the public spaces, which is what we did initially. Um, we look to every opportunity to introduce soft landscaping that helps to introduce vegetative cover into the neighborhood. And as you can imagine, given that it's a, um, an industrial area, there are limited opportunities to do that because the buildings are so close to the street. Um, the, if you go to the, nec the next slide, actually, we'll just skip these last three bu bullets. The most important thing we did at the outset from a design point of view was to look at precedents, landscape precedents that, um, that express um, industrial uh, heritage. Um, and we can go through these fairly quickly, Councillor. The, the, so, you know, we looked at large frame timbers um, which form part of the architecture. We looked at red brick um, and particularly distressed red brick. We looked at Corten steel, you'll notice is a big part of this. And it's a, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, um, a metal that actually strengthens over time as it rusts, it becomes a stronger material. It's very, very uh, flexible um, and is very close in character to, I think, expressing the, the uh, industrial heritage of the area. We can use it for curbing. We used it for the obelisk, which you're going to hear about later. Um, and so that became a very important element that we introduced at all three locations. So there's a commonality of design expression in all three sites. So it starts to feel like it's unified and part of the same uh, narrative. Next. Yeah, we looked at uh, interesting ways to use paving, which we'll talk about more later. More traditional uh, seating areas, which um, uh, uh, I think are, are appropriate given the heritage uh, nature of the precinct. Next. And of course, the railway tracks, which um, and we didn't know quite how far we were going to go with this, but we knew that we wanted to play off the idea that the, there was a, a spur line that ran right through the middle of Carla Dundas Triangle. And we wanted to make sure that that was expressed somehow um, in the design of the triangle. And lastly, I think it's important, and I, I'm sure Pierre, you're going to talk about this in a little bit as well. But one of the one of the most striking features of this neighborhood are the brick smokestacks, um, and there are more than a half a dozen of them, um, and they run north south. They're they're throughout the neighborhood, and they become very important elements, and they set the tone in terms of materiality because the 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 red brick. Um, in fact, many of these buildings were constructed with brick that was actually hauled out of the ground in this neighborhood, some of it out of the Don Valley as well. 
Um, so I wanted to make sure that everybody understood that there's a connection between the materials and uh, these elements. I think that's... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah we, we've included this one. It's, um, we wanted to make sure that we're providing opportunities for people to gather, but it's not just places to gather. It's also potential opportunities for the city and the neighborhood, uh, residents in the neighborhood, to engage directly with the landscape. So we wanted to see if there was an opportunity to perhaps to do, introduce a stage element um, that could be used um, by residents. That would require, require a little more elbow room than you're gonna find on the triangle, but certainly when we get to Badge Row, you'll understand how we were able to make that come to, come to light. I think that's the last one, Council. Oh, no. Got one more. Okay, and this is obviously the, one of the beauties of, of Corten um, is that you can laser cut almost anything you want, any pattern uh, into the Corten steel and it, uh, uh, this is something that we did in all three uh, spaces. Uh, the entrance sign into the Jimmy Simpson Park, uh, certainly the, the uh, obelisk um, is a masterwork of laser cutting. Uh, and we did the same thing at Badro, which you will see in a bit. I think that's the last one. That was the last one. I'm just going to go again here where we have the Jimmy Simpson entrance. We have the obelisk and the triangle and the Badgero Parquet, which uh, you'll talk about a bit later. Yep. So thank you so much. I'm just going to go to the Jimmy Simpson Park Gateway, part of the Carlaw and Dundas initiative. And you can certainly see that it is transformed, that entrance into Jimmy Simpson. It's very beautiful. And in our East End, we are uh, blessed not only with places, but we're blessed with people. And one of those people we were blessed with is uh, Jimmy Simpson. James Simpson, or Jimmy Simpson, he was uh, born in 1873 and he died in 1938. He was a British Canadian trade unionist. He was a printer journalist and a left-wing politician. He was a longtime member of Toronto City Council and he served as mayor. Uh, Jimmy Simpson was, uh, th and there's the beautiful new entrance, and as you can see, the Cortan Steel Cut. It is very lovely and part of the three projects that we have here. Another picture of that Cortan Steel with the planting. Very elegant new entrance to Jimmy Simpson Park. Again, another couple of views of that, turning that into an absolutely beautiful space. Uh, Jimmy Simpson, unfortunately, was run over by a streetcar and his, his um, political career was ended rather quickly. But he was a very strong, good labor mayor um, back in the early days of our city. I'm going to just ask you another question now, and this has to do with project components. You heard about the three. Um, hopefully everybody can see this. Were you aware of all three project components? There's a signature marker, that's the Triangle Parquet, the Jimmy Simpson Gateway, and the Badger Parquet before tonight, that this project had these three big ones, and I could throw Boston Commons on there, but it, um, isn't a park feature. And so there's pretty good awareness. I'm just going to end that shortly. Got another minute, a few seconds to vote. Okay, I'm going to end that. We can see that not everybody knew about all of them. Uh, and I'm going to share that. All three was 31%, only two, 49, and just the obelisk, 21. So everybody's learning a lot tonight about the neighborhood, I think, and the work that all of these consultants have been doing over the number of years to pull this whole beautiful project together. Very happy that you all are getting to see this. What we're going to do next is um, look at the actual car law. Dundas Triangle and 
obelisk that was designed by Pierre Poussin. And then Paul Nodwell will talk about how he designed the park around there. And I hope that um, I want to tell you a little bit about Pierre Poussin. He won the competition with his iconic brick obelisk signature marker. And he is a Mauritian public artist and sculptor who has the opportunity to create and install large public art installations across the country. He has had the pleasure of working with clients, including the cities of Toronto, Ottawa, Edmonton and Vancouver, numerous urban developers, architects and landscape architects, as well as the 2010 Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games, Sheridan College, McMaster University and Princeton University. He recently installed a featured light column for Toronto's new CAMH development on Queen West. Pierre's current projects include a cast metal sculpture called Ursa, which is scheduled to be installed next fall in Kelowna, BC, as well as integrated public artworks for the City of Ottawa's new LRT stations. And these are scheduled to be installed from 2021 to 2025. So you can see that, and you've heard, that we have simply a remarkable artist who has designed this most beautiful, beautiful obelisk for the Dundas Triangle. And Pierre, I'm going to ask you to take over and give us all we need to know about your beautiful piece of work. Well, thank you so much, uh, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, I, I really appreciate being here and uh, having been a part of this, this uh, terrific project. I'd like to take a, f a couple minutes just to thank, um, again, Councillor Paula Fletcher uh, for your uh, dogged de determination and um, uh, you, you kind of spearheading all of these projects. Uh, the City of Toronto, uh, East York Community Council, Sholin and Company, uh, specifically uh, Marcus Hillard and Paul Nodwell. Uh, I've worked with them very intimately throughout this project and um, I believe it's uh, working together really strengthened um, a lot of the elements, which, which I'm really, really happy to have been a part of. I'd like to also thank uh, Mike Billick from La Fontaine Ironworks, who, as Paul had mentioned, um, he fabricated, engineered, and also installed all uh, the obelisk itself. I'd also like to thank uh, from the city of Toronto, Peter Didiano and James Duff, who, like Paul mentioned, uh, kept us on track and on schedule. And also, uh, uh, lastly, Richard uh, Unterman, um, who has kind of uh, shared his in-depth heritage study, which was a big beginning of um, my, my project, essentially. Because for every project, uh, my public art projects, I really start to st uh, start with a site study. And so I was essentially at the, the reference library for <laughs> quite a few days, taking a look at old maps and, uh, and whatnot of uh, the Carla Dundas neighborhood. Here, could you speak up a little bit, please? Oh, sure. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. So as I was saying, I start my public art projects with a lot of research. And I, I started my research at the Toronto Reference Library and taking a look at old maps uh, from 1851 onwards, uh, which was essentially the first maps that uh, would, highlighted this area. And it was really uh, seeing Richard Undermann's um, study uh, and es essentially the layered approach that uh, he had, because at the reference library, the maps are, are gigantic. So it's hard to kind of pinpoint and, uh, and focus on one area, especially if the scales are all different. But uh, with Richard's study, it really allowed me to kind of focus in on just the, essentially the, ha um, the half circle area that we had uh, mentioned previously. And while studying kind of those areas, what really struck, struck out uh, for me uh, as an artist was the population progression. So if you take a look at 1851, the bottom map, uh, which is the earliest map, uh, and then you <clears throat> you go up the the maps and the dates. You see the the population and the um, the maps themselves become very very populated. 
So I essentially wanted to, uh, to celebrate this. I really, really thought that um, uh, the population growth, uh, especially after 19, the 1940s, was, was very interesting. And just because um, uh, I come from a very small town in northern Ontario, so seeing kind of this, the study of this population was, was, was very exciting for me. And, and also, I, um, this was also kind of the first area that I lived in, in Toronto, um, after studying from Sheridan College. I actually lived in the, uh, the, the tea shop, uh, the tea tree design building, which was just at Dundas and Carla. So I have a lot of familiar uh, uh, personal experience with smokestacks as well, because every day I would see giant smokestacks. And when I started kind of to live there, I started researching about the um, essentially the industry that was there. And I was really fascinated by the brick building industry, which uh, Paul had mentioned that uh, there was there used to be uh, brick building from close to the Don Valley. And because of the clay that was there, that was actually ideal for brick making, they ended up building a lot of Toronto's essentially uh, after the Industrial Revolution, they started using their bricks to essentially build Toronto. So I, th I thought that was... So I knew that I wanted to um, highlight the maps and also uh, make an, uh, an ode to the, the materials. And initially I thought about possibly using bricks as a building material, but there was a lot of limitations with that. And I, knowing that I wanted to kind of highlight the, the maps themselves, I really wanted to make it a, a line work study of abstraction of the, the grid, if you will, and the grid abstracting the obelisk. And so, um, yeah, rich, uh, brick making, there we go. And here was a, a essentially a, uh, a study of the size and the shape of the obelisk. I wanted to make a, using a, a, a three-sided pyramid, not a four-sided pyramid, just for a more modern take on an obelisk. And also wanted to make it a three-sided instead of a, instead of a circular, uh, which would be too much, uh, too close to a smokestack. So I kind of decided on the obelisk uh, and also wanted to make it so um, uh, to incorporate lighting in there as well. So Paul and I had detailed discussions about uh, lighting and how to incorporate it. And essentially where the, in the maps that you find in urban centers, uh, the you are here maps, the you are here spots, there is essentially a small um, star where we actually are in the neighborhood of Darlan, uh, Carla and Dundas Triangle, and those are actually highlighted by the lights as well. So all the lights that we see in the, in the, in the um, installed piece, we will essentially see you are here, kind of Mark. So it's a bit of an inside, uh, not an inside joke, but I like to kind of uh, add a, a little bit of humor in my work, but also, just a nod that people, once they understand, then they kind of see all the stars and the progression and the, the tightening of the line work as you go up. So, and using the, the lights as well, um, will, would also highlight the, the volume of the, this obelisk, because, you, you know, once you do see it, it's, uh, it is a pretty hefty, it's a visual kind of marker that uh, we wanted to really highlight. This is uh, during the installation um, with Mike Billick and his team. Uh, there was a bit of uh, fun things during this installation, but um, the wires were a bit of a challenge, let's just say. And the crane that we had rented, uh, the first crane actually was uh, not working, let's just say, so we had to quickly hire another crane. And it was good because it was like five days before Christmas of last year. So it was, it was hard to get a crane person. But uh, we did not nonetheless. And the site um, was all prepared for the foundation that we had designed. And we installed the, um, the obelisk uh, before the landscape was done just for um, the, the grounding of it. Because we also didn't want to damage any of the, the work that uh, 
Paul and uh, Sholin and company would uh, later produce uh, the landscape and the embedded lighting in there. So you just see the scale of it and it was, and also just a nod on the um, I mention of the Corten steel. Um, Mike Billick, we had, we had this made in Barrie, uh, Ontario, just a couple hours north of Toronto. And on his land, we were able to essentially rust out the, uh, the obelisk uh, where we wanted the texture to be. Uh, we wanted it to be, it to be already, al already uh, mid-rust as we brought it on site to really bring out that uh, beautiful rust texture. And as Paul had mentioned, um, uh, Corten is used industrially uh, quite a bit, but it's also the primary um, material in boat building. So boats hulls are actually, most of them are made of Corten steel, which uh, the rust actually protects it from all the elements. So it becomes stronger as it gets older, which, uh, which I, I, yeah. And it's actually my first time um, using Corten steel. So I, I was very excited about that. So you can actually see the stars um, if you, if you uh, zoom or you might not be able to zoom in, but there is essentially a, a small, it looks like a circle uh, just on the top left hand side. And as you, as you move up the, um, the obelisk, you see the repetition, not necessarily the repetition of the map, but the rest, repetition of the land as you go up. So it does get uh, kind of more dense or actually it's the inverse of that. It's, uh, the, uh, the line work becomes more dense um, so there's more cutting, so it becomes actually lighter as you go up, as you progress. And this was the installation for 2019. And then I believe the next slide is the, and this is the, uh, the, the finished work, which I, I really do uh, take my hat off to uh, uh, Sholin and company. The landscape was absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous. And see, you can actually see the twinkling, the see the the uh, the lighting within the piece is actually where we are on the map. So I just wanted to to kind of focus on that. Yeah. So uh, that concludes uh, my kind of short presentation on the obelisk. And again, I'd like to to thank everyone involved. It's been um, it's been an honor and a lot of fun to work on this. <clears throat> so. Well, thank you very much, Pierre. It really is an absolutely stunningly beautiful piece and we're so happy to have it in thank the neighborhood. You. I'm just gonna turn over now to you, Paul, because you're going to talk about the rest of the triangle and how you designed that to fit the obelisk, not the other way around. Right, right. Um, I, I'm, I'm also gonna uh, mention that I forgot to uh, thank working with Pierre because I'll tell you it was it was a terrific collaboration. Um, once once we had sort of resolved on where the monument would be sited exactly and how landscape would relate to it, um, he was engaged and involved in the process uh, pretty much all the way through. In fact, we ended up on many site meetings with him at the same time. So, thank you, Pierre, for your contribution to the the collaboration. Um, I think probably the best decision we made, and uh, Councillor Fletcher, you'll remember this from the very beginning, is we agreed not to design the landscape until we had the signature marker decided on, until we knew who was doing it and what it looked like and what the story was behind it. And so we didn't, we didn't design anything. Um, and then once Pierre came forward with this gorgeous obelisk, um, our first reaction was, what a great story. So how can we <clears throat> use the landscape to build on that story? And if you go to the next slide. So basically Pierre's piece is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the subject of population growth, but also it's also a story of transportation and how the road patterns have evolved and changed and intensified over generations. And 
so we took that as saying, okay, so if we've, if we've got a transportation story here, maybe we should talk about the railway. And I tripped over this map of the Grand Trunk Railroad, which extends from Halifax to Chicago. There are many spur lines. It stops in Sarnia and North Bay and, uh, you know, Toronto for sure, um, London, uh, uh, Kitchener. I'm not sure um, uh, where all of the spur lines went. We didn't get into that kind of level of detail. We had to work with kind of the bare bones uh, or the major move, as it were. Um, and so we decided to build the landscape around this story. We, and the Grand Trunk Railroad has played such an important role in, in the, the evolution of this neighborhood. And as uh, Richard mentioned, the, the, the railway line defines the entire um, western boundary of this neighborhood. And so why not celebrate that? Um, so that, that was our first clue, and that gave us then the clue as to where to site Pierre's obelisk, because it would end up right smack dab in the middle in Toronto um, as part of this larger story. So that was exciting to start to develop. Try next slide. There we go. Oh. So this is this is the one of the original master plan concepts for the triangle. Um, I can't see it all right now, so um, I may miss something. But essentially, the the elements. Um, hang on, so essentially, what we proposed is a representation of the Great Lakes, a representation of the um, Grand Trunk Railroad, the sighting of the obelisk. We used the, the triangular shape of the obelisk to set up the orientation of benches and seating so that they would be in line with corners of the triangle. So you're going to get more of a view of two parts rather than just one flat plane. Um, planting, of course, we used all native spe species. Um, the grid line that you see there that, that runs roughly north-south is representative of the original survey grid that Lord Simcoe uh, used in uh, the early expansion and exploration of Ontario. And if we go to the next slide. So I'm going to run through just a few of the renderings that we did to kind of test how this design approach would end up looking. You go to the, this is a more of an aerial view from the south. Next slide. We talked about lighting and how to go about it. And at one point we talked about, you know, it being lit, lit along the three edges of the obelisk and we rejected that in favor of having it lit internally, just given that the, the cut steel is, is the, really the, the feature. Next. Another study just to look at scale um, and how, how large the monument would feel relative to the adjacent buildings. Next. More of a detailed look. Oh, and you can see that we've actually, we're showing the names of some of the towns and villages that the trunk line um, went to and is located on the site. Next. And this is one that uh, I think is cl closer to the finished product for sure. <clears throat> Next, please. Um, we also have introduced an element in the design, which is um, it's an acid etched photo uh, on stainless steel. Uh, you can't really see it because of the glare on this one, but if you get up close to it, it's it's the it was actually the last photograph that Richard showed in his presentation. 
And we actually managed to get a, an acid etched stainless steel frame um, for this photo. And they, it provides two functions. One, of course, is to reinforce the narrative of the industrial heritage of the neighborhood. And the other function is to screen, to the extent that we can, the parking lot to the west. Um, so it kind of helps to anchor the space. Um, and then there's an existing fence, which I'm sure many of you have seen and wondered why that's still there. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're actually looking at growing ivy on it so that it's a green, green wall until we know whether there are any uh, uh, potential moves to change or expand the park. Next. Yeah, that's kind of a good night shot of both of them. You can see the, the photographic image a little bit better in that one. Um, I should mention, if you see the, the bright lights on the ground, maybe go to the next slide. That'll be a better one for this. Yeah, so you'll see a number of puck lights. They're in-ground up lights that sort of punctuate the plaza space. And they're all at the intersections of uh, brass inlays that represent the Grand Trunk Railway. And <clears throat> each of the puck lights is a major town or city on the Grand Trunk Railroad. So, and we, we initially talked about maybe having, having the names of the towns embedded as well, but we thought it was maybe a little more playful if people go and try to figure it out for themselves. What, what city is what? And uh, so we didn't do the inlaid names, um, but we did the brass inlay and the puck lights. There you can see the wall being constructed. And again, Mike Billick was hugely helpful in pulling all of this together. Next. I think that that's, uh, that's it. Then we're going to the Badger Oak Parquet. Yep. But before we do that, I'm just going to go back to that beautiful picture and uh, have another poll with you. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for explaining that background and how you designed the triangle around the stunning piece that Pierre created and the themes that you have running both up into the air and on the ground. It's, it's spectacular and we're getting people writing on the Q&A and saying how much they love it and thanking you very much. I also want to say that just across the street, we have another great thing that happened in the neighborhood and that's Crow's Theater. So there's so many fantastic things right at the corner of uh, Carla and Dundas and then we have the great Dundas Carla Cafe. So there's a lot going on. It's very active and animated and this centerpiece will just um, emphasize what a wonderful neighborhood it is and for those who are going for a coffee or those who are going to the theater it will be a spectacular draw and something that i think the whole neighborhood is extremely proud of and just want to thank you again paul and pierre for your creation of this and for the love and thought that you've put into it I am going to uh, just ask you another question, and this has got to do with now that you know more about the design of the obelisk and, of course, the um, triangle, will you go over and have a closer look, try to identify some of those things? And I think that everybody, a couple of you won't be going, but 97% uh, of you are going to be going over and having a closer look. And I think that tonight's guests and their presentations and their explanations is um, really gives you a really great uh, start to really appreciate what a fantastic piece of art we have now uh, at this signature marker and the signature corner. I'm going to move along now, Paul, to you again. You're going to stay on, on the screen. And there is a third the Jimmy Simpson is now complete, the entrance. The triangle with the signature marker, the obelisk is complete. And there's one outstanding part of the, the three parks and that's the Badger Oak Parquet. So I'm going to turn that over to you now. And would you like that first slide? Because that was the former condition here. Thank you, Councillor. 
That's kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> this is the existing condition at Badgerow, and you can see it's actually a fairly generous sized space, um, but it doesn't really understand what it's supposed to be. Um, you know, the low quality paving, the planting is either dead or dying and of low quality. Uh, timber walls that are kind of falling over and a little beat up over the years. Um, no furniture to speak of. And then there's that large blank brick wall of the hydro building. And so our challenge here was really to um, try to connect the space to that brick wall and to the street. Um, we wanted to make sure that we used the project to convey the rich manufacturing and industrial history of the neighborhood. Obviously, that was consistent with our goals from the beginning. We wanted to create a space that offers a range of functions for the city and residents. Uh, we wanted to use rich materials and finishes that are consistent with the chosen materials palette for all three parks, which I've talked about before. We wanted to introduce a meaningful, large well mount, uh, wall mounted image on the brick hydro wall so that it serves as both a backdrop for the space as well as an iconic visual to be seen from afar as you're driving north on Carla. Um, we also wanted to introduce uh, soft landscaping and plantings here that recalled um, the market garden history of this neighborhood. Um, it was a great opportunity to do that. And um, so we've uh, done that. We go to the next slide, we'll see the plan. <coughs> so <clears throat> basically we came up with a, a plan for the space that features the wall, introduces new plantings, as I said, and then introduces a number of different elements that describe the industrial and manufacturing history of the neighborhood. And I'm not gonna to say too much more about that until we get moving along here to the next. There are a couple of views coming up that are some perspective views. Next slide. So you can see that's kind of what we were thinking initially that there would be um, not only an opportunity to engage with the site directly, um, there's a small sort of L shape to the property which draws you back behind the hydro building. So we're looking at improving that with some screening of the parking lot as well as improved lighting for safety. Um, and then the introduction of a, a stage. Whoops, Whoops sorry. Okay. <laughs> There's your stage. Yeah, so an introduction of the stage that builds on the contours of, you know, the Don Valley and the brickworks. Um, and then a number of other elements, which I think are shown on the slide that we just showed <laughs> by mistake. So we wanted to play on this idea of the manufacturing. And so we looked at uh, a paving pattern that represents a factory worker's punch card. Um, that, you know, that's, that's something that's kind of a no-brainer. It's such a distinctive and random, uh, seemingly random pattern, and it's perfectly suited to pavement. We also looked at benches that recall a Wrigley's gum packet um, and a bench that resembles uh, the Stanley Piano Company, and not, not just Stanley Piano Company. This Actually, this neighborhood um, had a, a lot of um, uh, piano manufacturing and repair um, operations uh, up and down the street. And then, of course, uh, Col Colgate Palmolive, where we tried to abstract into a planter for the trees that would be sitting along the street edge. And then... If we go to the next slide, I think. So uh, I know it looks like we haven't done anything out there yet, but we are continuing to work on it. I wanted to show two or three slides of the manufacturing work that's already being done on the piano bench, 
and the palmolive uh, planter. Go to the next slide. You can see bar and palm olive is on one of the other ones. And the next. And there's your gum pack. So we'll, we'll look forward to getting this in. I think, Peter, you're going to talk about the timing. Oh, here, that, this is actually a good shot because it, it shows the Corten wall as well with the, uh, the names of the various companies. And some of them aren't, like Woods, for example, isn't represented in the landscape directly, but it's um, called out on the uh, retaining wall. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Wow. Can't wait. Uh, I think Peter's going to come up next, and he's going to tell us when this will start. I know that if you're all living in the neighborhood, you've seen that the site has been completely um, cleared uh, from the initial picture that you showed us, Paul, mm. to now. Yeah. It's getting ready to accept these fantastic installations and the fantastic art. And I don't know if you mentioned the mural. Is that still a part of the, um, the project? It, it is for sure. I'm just going to go back there to that a slide. Yeah. If you could just address that for a second, too. It, it is for sure part of the project. We're just trying to work out exactly what the details are. Um, and Hydro has been very cooperative in terms of working with us to make sure it can happen. So um, it, it, well, it, it won't be this image directly, but it'll, it'll be something along those lines for sure. That's great. Um, thank you very much. Peter, I think everybody's really interested in what you have to tell us about when this work can start and uh, when this work will finish. And I know, I think everybody knows that these haven't been the easiest projects for all kinds of reasons. There's site contamination, there's vaults, this is a hydro vault. So the parks department has been very patient and dogged in making sure that all the Everything's tied up in a bow, so these projects can go forward. And obviously, uh, everything got solved at the at the triangle. Uh, we've just finally solved some of the lease issues with Ontario Hydro here, and getting everything absolutely ready to start. So, Peter, will you give us a, a snapshot of what's going to happen next on this site, please? I'm going to leave this picture up so everybody can see how beautiful it's going to be. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Councillor. So as Paul mentioned that uh, there's some images there of some of the elements that are going to be incorporated into this project. So just to uh, let you know that the work is still ongoing. Uh, there's still other things being fabricated off site that will be uh, ready for installation. Unfortunately, the contractor couldn't get to this uh, area um, or this site uh, as early as we wanted them to. Uh, however, uh, we're excited that he's going to get here first thing in the spring. It'll be his first project of the season for his company. Uh, so there's a lot of positives in that. Uh, we anticipate the work will begin as soon as the frost is out of the ground and the weather is conducive to this type of work. Uh, so we expect him to be in there probably late March, early April. And uh, the anticipated duration of the project is approximately four months. Um, and given that everything is being fabricated over the uh, winter, uh, everything should be available to go first thing in the spring. And we think that you could probably do better on that schedule. But we anticipate a four-month schedule nonetheless, and the work should be completed uh, hopefully by, by the end of June, or early, uh, early July. 2021. 2021. And hopefully the pandemic will have be over and we can celebrate in person at this time instead of uh, virtually. And I just Thank want to you. add, it's, it's yes. the same, con same contractor who's done both Jimmy Simpson Gateway and the Triangle. So the quality of construction uh, is going to be replicated here as well. And I think we're lucky to have this uh, general contractor. He does amazing work for us at the city. Uh, he doesn't do very many projects for us, but the projects he does do, he does them excellently and uh, he, makes them to, he makes them last. Absolutely. That's great. So hopefully the contractor, we can pay tribute to the great work in all these installations when we, uh, when we open this park next summer in yes. 2021. I know you'll invite him along and thank you very much Peter for all your guidance and and making sure these all come to come to fruition. Very much appreciated. Thank it's you. a lot of hard work. 
what goes behind the scenes compared to what we see, there's a lot that goes on. It's been a journey. Uh, it's been a journey and we're still journeying north up to Badger Oak. That's right. Um, I'm just going to take you through a few more things and this is the Heritage Plaque District. And I think uh, you may or may not know that in 2018, based on all the work that Richard and his team done and uh, done and Sholin had done, that Heritage Toronto uh, launched the Dundas and Carlaw Heritage Plaque District with a focus on um, industrial heritage. It's really the first one in the city of Toronto and Heritage Toronto collected firsthand accounts from the public, from couples who met while working on uh, in the Carla factories to families who were employed in the neighborhood. Altogether, there are 10 plaques and you can see them. One, there's the industrial heritage. There's the reliable toy factory. That's an actual plaque. And there was the first guided walk tour that was held by Heritage Toronto. It is a self-guided tour through Heritage Toronto, which you can do yourself. It focuses on the iconic buildings, the businesses, people, and moments in history of the area. This is the first district of its kind in the city of Toronto. That would be a plaque district where there's a number of plaques. And it's the first industrial history plaque, uh, set of plaques in the city of Toronto. And it's all courtesy of this project and the great people that have worked on that. I don't know who went on this walk, but I'm going to do one more poll here tonight. And I'm going to ask uh, if anybody here, now, uh, would you be interested in joining another guided walk by Heritage Toronto in the spring to look at the plaques and the public realm elements mm -hmm. and uh, probably the murals as well when, when we get to that next, but perhaps when we would launch the um, Badger Parquet, could start Jimmy Simpson and come up looking at all the plaques. And large number of people are feeling like they might like to do that. So that would probably be a good thing to bring everybody together and close off the last project. I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. And we have 97% of people who would like to do that. So we will definitely make sure that that happens. There's also one other project that stemmed from the Carla, the Dundas Carla project, and it is the East End Bridges to Art. When this project was being done, you know how many bridges there are, and you know, uh, now you really know because there's were so many railroads. We still have trains um, and go trains and soon other kinds of trains, but this is a project through Ward, was Ward 30 at the time, it's now Ward 14. There are nine bridges that uh, carry trains across the ward. There's more bridges uh, than any other part of Toronto. So East End Bridges to Art is an integrated street art vision with all of the, ro the road bridges in Ward 14. There's nine of them, as I said. There's one on Eastern and they go all the way up to Coxwell. Three of them are within the historic Carla Dundas Rail Corridor. The one on Logan, the one up Carlaw, and the one at Girard and Carlaw. So working in collaboration with Street Art Toronto, a program that Toronto uh, City of Toronto Transportation Services runs, and in consultation with the community, these bridges were transformed into art. And uh, there's more to come. I think we have four done, five to go. This is the one on Girard. This is actually up on Jones. And the latest one, which you can see is actually on Carlaw itself. Can't see it here, but I'm sure when you're going up the street, it's on Carlaw itself and it is dedicated to water. One of the themes was water and the connection to water, industry and the connection to industry. Uh, one that's dedicated and completely created by uh, First Nations, and that's the one that's going to be on Coxwell. And um, there'll be other ones. Please stay tuned for those. They're all beautifying our community, and they're all part of a, a thread of the bridges that we have that have played an important role 
in the history of our neighborhood. Well, that brings us to the end of our slideshow. I don't know if there's any comments any of the guests would like to make. And also, we had had a few questions. I think most of them have been answered. Pierre, somebody wants to know uh, about you going to Sheridan College. That was, um, there we go. Did you go to Sheridan College? Yeah, I, I, w I went to Sheridan for furniture design uh, back in 2003. Wow, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Not that long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but I actually uh, first started off in biochemistry at uh, Ottawa University and then branched off. <laughs> well, that's it. There's a few other questions there, um, which we'll get. We'll, link, we'll send you the link for everything. We'll send you the link to the walking tour. We'll send you the link to the heritage, uh, the heritage study. And we'll send you the link to um, some of the slides from, from the slideshow. And anything else you'd like, please write in and ask for that. I do want to really thank our guests and key collaborators for being here tonight. And I do want to just move down to our very last slide which is that, and to thank Paul Nodwell and the team at Scholen and Company, Richard Unterman, Pierre Poisson, Peter Didiano, James Duff, and the whole team at Parks, Forestry, and Recreation, Elise Parker and Carolyn Taylor from Transportation Services. We had a stakeholder working group that assisted in pulling everything together. I want to thank my team, Susan Saran, Laura Anonan, and Nick Velvarde and all the residents of Ward 14 and everyone who joined us for this virtual launch tonight. Thanks very much for spending time with us and celebrating what I think will become uh, just a citywide recognized, absolutely beautiful spot. And all of you lucky folks that get to see it every night. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care, stay safe, be well. Good job on the uh, fireworks, counselor. Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> Nicely done. That was, that was, that Thank was a you. Nice, nice present. Thank you, everybody, for your participation and all your love and energy into this fantastic project. It's a, it's a great one. My, Take care. My, my pleasure. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Thank good you. Good night, everybody. Yes. Oh, it was great. I can have a bite to eat. Is, that, big trout. is it so on? Um, I turned it off. Are we done? Uh, so just click. Where am I clicking? Uh, stop share. Stop share. There we go. Can I get out? I uh, think you just click anything at the bottom.